So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Diane Rollman, and I am the director of the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest. And I have just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, please mute your microphone and turn off your video. You can, mit, can sub, you can submit questions for a question and answer session by using the chat function, and this is located at the bottom of the screen. We may not get to all of the questions during the webinar, but we plan to compile them and release an FAQ document after the webinar. We are recording the webinar, so it will be available for later viewing. And after the webinar, you'll be invited to take a short survey to provide feedback, and you'll be sent an email containing the link to the employer guide. So on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared novel coronavirus disease 2019, otherwise known as COVID-19, to be a global pandemic. Since then, communities, businesses, and employees quickly adopted a new normal. And this new normal was characterized by a widespread social distancing and stay-at-home orders. This has created new challenges for employers to protect the safety and health of their workforce a workforce that consists um, of people who are essential employees, remote employees, and displaced workers. Today, we are launching the Total Worker Health COVID-19 Employer Guide. The guide was developed based on case studies from the Midwest employers and describes innovative approaches and lessons learned by industry leaders. Using these case studies as examples, today we're gonna to highlight best practices and resources to, that support employee well-being. We're gonna talk about policies that address worker hazards, the protection of essential workers who cannot work remotely, and strategies to prepare for return to work during and after the pandemic. Next slide. The COVID-19 Employer Guide is a product of a collaboration between the St. Louis Business Health Coalition, the Nebraska Safety Council, and the uh, uh, KU School of Medicine, Wichita at the University of Kansas, and the Healthier Workforce Center. The Healthier Workforce Center brought together these leaders in health and safety to develop this guide for employers focusing on worker safety, health, and well-being. So the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest is a total worker health center, center of excellence funded by NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And it's a partnership between the University of Iowa, Washington University in St. Louis, and the Nebraska Safety Council. Our mission is to protect and preserve worker safety and health through knowledge generation or research and dissemination of evidence-based total worker health practices. The Total Worker Health Program was launched in 2011 by NIOSH. Um, Total Worker Health focuses on the program policies and practices that first start with protecting the worker um, safety and is then expanded to include the promotion of health with the overall goal of improving worker well being. Controlling exposures to occupational hazards is the fundamental method to protect workers. Often, a hierarchy of controls is used to determine how to implement feasible and effective control solutions. Items near the top of the hierarchy are considered to be more effective in protecting the workers than the items at the bottom. This figure shows how the hierarchy of controls has been adapted to include not only traditional workplace hazards, but also the organization of work itself. We use this approach in identifying recommendations that are presented in the employer guide. The Healthier Workforce Center has also developed other resources for employers. These include videos, podcasts, and short workplace activities or toolbox talks that can be used in the workplace. These resources also include a homepage with COVID-19 resources. All of these resources are free and available for use. During our remaining time, we'll provide a brief overview of the employer guide, present employer case studies, and hold a question and answer session. I'll now turn it over to Lauren Remsbecker from the St. Louis Business Health Coalition. Thank you, Diane. My name is Lauren Remsbecker and I am the Senior Director of Member Engagement and Communications for the St. Louis Area Business Health Coalition. For the last 38 years, we have been supporting leading employers in enhancing the well-being of their employees, 
and obtaining the greatest value for their investments and health benefits. We were fortunate to become a Total Worker Health affiliate in the 2017 year and have since been collaborating with the Healthier Workforce Center of the Midwest to help translate evidence-based research into practical tools that can be used by employers. Today, I'll be providing a brief introduction to our Total Worker Health Employer Guide, COVID-19 edition. But as Diane said, we will be sending an email with the link to this guide after the presentation, which will elaborate on all of these strategies and also provide specific resources for each of the sections that we'll be covering. In considering worker well-being during a pandemic, there are several hazards that we need to be aware of as organizations. A recent survey by Gallup of Americans showed that in just the first couple of weeks of social distancing practices, 15% of Americans reported that their mental health was already suffering, and another 37% expected this to decline in the coming weeks. This is to be expected as we are dealing with unprecedented events and there can be overwhelming news media coverage, which can cause fe feelings of hopelessness, despair, and grief. Employees may also be dealing with isolation and loneliness as a result of losing the connectivity with their family and friends, while also balancing family and caregiving needs, which can add stress. In addition to mental health, 9% of respondents reported that they were experiencing financial hardships, and another 37% anticipated future challenges in this area. This can expect to continue to increase as we see our economic downturn and employee uh, business closures uh, continue to advance throughout this time period. In addition, one third reported getting less exercise or having a worse diet. Uh, and again, this can be interrupted uh, by the displacement in our typical routines and limited resource access, whether that be to grocery stores, gyms, or other typical healthcare needs that we would traditionally have availability. When addressing worker well-being, we suggest that organizations start by outlining existing resources that might be available for the different well-being topic areas. This might include organizational resources such as an employee assistance program, a currently available health plan, or other wellness programs and vendor partnerships that already exist. In addition, during this time, it's important to look to the local community and consider how hospitals, disease associations, nonprofit organizations, and other small businesses may be able to support employees in getting access to basic needs. Within the employer guide that you'll be sent by email, you will see a link to a template that can be used to help you with this outline process. When we consider specific strategies within these areas, in looking at mental health, it's important to continue to remind employees that they are valued and appreciated. We've seen several employers have success with this in using leadership emails or videos. Also establishing open two-way communication between managers and employees. And in doing so, ensuring that managers have the training to appropriately understand what mental health resources are available and how they can provide support to employees that may be having immediate concerns. There are a number of virtual therapy options that are now available through telehealth. And we also have phone apps, which we've outlined in the guide, that can provide a low cost or even free opportunity for employees to receive assistance. Additionally, general reminders about spending time outside, adopting new hobbies, or looking into mindfulness and meditation might be good suggestions to help employees cope with the new feelings during this pandemic. From a financial well-being perspective, it's important that transparent and advanced notice is given to employees on any interruptions or changes to business operations. This helps them to receive reassurance on their status as a worker, but also the fiscal health of the organization as a whole. We've seen many employers start to activate emergency relief funds, which allow employees and other organizational leaders to contribute to those employees that may be in need as well as seeking foundation and other community donations. For those of you with essential employees, a hazard pay arrangement or an increase in pay may be helpful to recognize the increased risks that they are facing in working on the job. And of course, there's a number of federal assistance programs that are being activated as a result of new legislation. 
Some of you may already be aware that April is Financial Literacy Month, so it's important that during the pandemic, we don't forget to educate employees about healthy behaviors, like setting a budget or increasing short-term uh, savings if resources are available. And of course, like we said, looking to local community services that can help employees address basic needs like food access, housing, and healthcare. From a social connectivity standpoint, we're seeing employers become more and more comfortable with using private social media groups or employee portals as a way to connect employees. This might be a fun opportunity for people to share pictures and also connect with one another to talk about challenges and to reassure each other and the feelings that they are experiencing. If you do not already have employee support or research group, resource groups developed, this would be a great time to create those um, based on common interests that might be shared amongst different groups of employees. Additionally, looking at continuing to host informal social engagements, such as birthday parties, coffee breaks, work anniversaries, and other celebrations, and thinking about extending access to social platforms and web conferencing systems so that employees can connect safely with their family and friends. Finally, remembering to have public recognition of employees for their contributions at work and in the community during this time. From a physical standpoint, um, we know that routines have been interrupted, uh, so it's important to help employees think about how they can plan around the current needs within the pandemic. Um, this may include looking at things like equipment rental programs through local gyms, virtual sessions and online videos for physical activity and cooking demonstrations, hosting activity breaks that are led by a staff member, or perhaps putting together a fun well-being challenge with reminders to move and get active. You may also look at uh, helping to subsidize or at least connect employees with grocery delivery options and healthy restaurants within the local community and consider how flexible work arrangements can play a role in helping them to meet basic needs. For family support, we know many are dealing with caregiving responsibilities and that emergency leave has been expanded through federal legislation. Uh, in addition, uh, employers may consider subsidizing or offering reimburse reimbursements for child care or elder care needs during this time or providing advanced uh, flexible spending account contributions that can assist employees. Additionally, looking for sitter search services such as care.com and developing unique programs for your organization to find backup care if it's needed. And again, emphasizing flexible work policies and allowing employees to adjust their hours if they need to take care of children or other family members. And then finally, we know that healthcare is particularly difficult to navigate, but especially so during a pandemic. So making sure that you're referencing the CDC for reliable information on disease screening, symptoms, and treatment, minimizing cost sharing for COVID-19 uh, treatment and testing, and then looking at high-risk populations, um, those that might be immunocompromised, as well as those that might need pharmacy delivery during this time, working with your pharmacy benefit manager or a local retailer to do that as well as disease management programs that could provide assistance through texting or online support for chronic care needs. For remote workers, those that are going to now be adjusting to perhaps a new norm when it comes to working from home, there are some hazards that we want to consider. And you can see that based on a recent Society for Human Resource Management survey, two thirds of employers are now transitioning additional employees to remote work on a full-time or part-time basis. But we need to consider how technological infrastructure, home work environments, and team adaptation challenges may present a hazard or risk to these employees. In looking at specific strategies, you can start by doing a gap assessment of your technology needs and looking for new devices, software, or other tools that employees might need to purchase or be reimbursed for to get their work done. This includes looking at the secure Wi-Fi networks that are available in employee homes and ensuring that software um, and computer devices have appropriate antivirus. You may also wanna extend your virtual private network or other file saving devices so employees have access to necessary files and can share those widely with each other. From an ergonomic standpoint, we've provided checklists and examples of other assessments in the guide that can be used to help employees in establishing a good workplace design at home. This includes looking at specific office equipment like chairs and desks, lighting, and other noise reducing uh, tools that might be helpful. 
as well as educating employees around the injuries that can be present from adjusting to a new work environment, including back, arm, eye, and other strains to the body. This can be mitigated by encouraging people to have healthy behaviors, such as a correct posture, and taking frequent breaks from screens, as well as to be active. In looking at team dynamics, we want to ensure that communication preferences of employees are being monitored and that you're helping managers to adjust to those specific needs. Teams should hopefully be connect connecting on a weekly, if not daily basis to address ongoing needs. And again, as you're transitioning to a new environment, it's important to make sure employees know which tasks need to be prioritized, what are their expectations for deadlines and different commitments, as well as how are they going to be uh, interacting with each other and clients on the phone and via web conferencing. And then finally, we're all struggling with work-life balance at this time. So it might be a good idea to incorporate family updates into team connection calls if possible so that everyone feels like they can uh, remain connected on a personal level. Also encourage employees to establish daily schedules and routines and to separate their work and relaxation spaces in the home if possible. This is all about setting clear boundaries around where work is completed as well as the hours that that might be done, while still understanding that personal interruptions such as children and pets are going to become more frequent during this time. From an essential worker standpoint, we know that hourly workers in healthcare, food service, manufacturing, and retail are the least likely to be able to work from home during this time. This can present some challenges as they try to adapt to physical distancing guidelines while accommodating business operation needs. They all will also experience higher risk of disease transmission from being in the workplace environment, as well as added stress of monitoring disease exposure and planning for work disruptions. To help address these hazards, we suggest specific strategies around the areas of workplace controls. This includes looking at the OSHA recommendations for industry-specific risks based on worker roles. Many of us have already restricted meetings and travel, but we may also consider physical spacing within the workplace to accommodate that six feet distance need. Additionally, restricting shift times and reducing uh, work pods to smaller sizes can help to minimize the number of employees in a building at one time, while also limiting personal interactions with customers and outside vendors by doing curbside or no contact operation or installing physical barriers if necessary. Of course, personal protective equipment, whether it be masks or other appropriate equipment based on a role, uh, will be important during this time. And that should also be considered for employees that are commuting via, via mass and public transit to ensure they stay safe while traveling to work. And of course, looking at filtration and ven ventilation uh, to make sure that your systems are working appropriately and to work with your building management to ensure that the risks of exposure via air are being minimized. For hygiene and sanitation, we talk a little bit about cleaning and staff training and specifically provide links to Environmental Protection Agency disinfectants that have been recommended against COVID-19. Uh, recommendations as well around hand washing signage and increasing soap dispensers and hand sanitizers within the workplace. And also reminding employees to minimize touching of their faces as well as other surfaces that might be shared such as door handles and propping doors open if possible. And finally, for screening and reporting, uh, we've seen many employers start to minimize their attendance penalties and encourage relaxed sick, pol sick policies or additional time off so that employees are encouraged to stay home if they aren't feeling well. Other employers have instigated temperature taking at a single entrance within buildings and also screening for symptoms of respiratory illness and other exposure risks of COVID-19. We recommend looking at your public health department or the CDC guidelines around testing and quarantine, and also working with your local public health department to ensure that those that might be at risk of being exposed to an ill coworker um, have the appropriate procedures in place to be contacted. We'll talk a little bit more about return to work next, but certainly again, continue to monitor injuries and report COVID-19 exposures based on OSHA record keeping priorities. We've included a chart here in looking at the return to work guidelines that have started to be released on a federal and state level. You can see that much of this is being taken on a phased in approach and they have divided 
companies into different categories based on their industry and their infection risk. Those that are most essential to economic recovery and that have the lowest infection risk will be first priority for opening. Those that are less essential industries and low infection risk or more essential industries with a higher infection risk will be dependent on how infection rates continue to proceed. And those that are the least essential but having the highest infection risk will be the last priority to reopen at this time. Specific strategies for your organization to consider as you look at reopening would be monitoring CDC and local public health department data that is available to understand the number of cases that are currently happening in your community and the capacity of your hospitals to care for people that are ill. There are public health and government guidelines that will need to be referenced to ensure it is safe to reopen. And of course, looking first to make sure that essential employees can return to work. And then considering which job roles may be able to remain remote and consider implementing permanent telecommuting policies if needed. Uh, workplace controls should continue to be used as we've addressed in earlier sections. And virus and antibody testing, while it is starting to become more available, should be referenced from a CDC standpoint as to if it's appropriate and necessary for employees to return to work using those tests. High-risk populations need to be continued to monitor and of course evaluating these concerns over time to ensure that there is not a need to uh, return back to the pandemic strategies that we've discussed earlier. For future preparations, a vaccine will likely be available in the next 12 months, so considering how you will provide access and affordability for employees and their family members. Continue to document your best practices and lessons learned during this time period so that you can apply it to future pandemic planning efforts and ensure that if you didn't already have a business continuity plan in place to begin working on that so that you can address it in future emergencies. You'll hear later from an employer that has started an infectious disease response team, which can be a really effective tool when dealing with these emergencies. And some organizations have also considered uh, hiring a chief medical officer so that they can have future clinical guidance when it comes to any other disease concerns. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Chris from the Nebraska Safety Council to kick off our employer panel. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you, Lauren. I'm uh, Chris Blum, the Business Development Manager uh, with the Nebraska Safety Council. Uh, today, we have with us three panelists. Uh, for our guide here, we uh, included 13 case statements from a variety of industries. For the, um, these industries come from manufacturing, academic, financial, nonprofit, and healthcare. Each of the cases presented unique strategies, and these are highlighted in the guide. Be sure to look for the bold type and the orange light bulbs. Uh, we have three individuals joining us today to share their stories. Our first um, panelist is Doug Wyatt. Doug is the senior, he is the surgery center director and clinic administrator for Lincoln Orthopedic Center. Doug received a Bachelor of Science degree in business administration from Nebraska Wesleyan. He received uh, his paramedic training from Southeast Community College and worked 22 years as a nationally registered paramedic, field training officer, and market general manager for a private ambulance service. So, Doug, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I will turn it over to you to share your story with us. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be, to be involved in this forum. <clears throat> My name is Doug Wyatt, and I serve as the administrator of Lincoln Orthopedic Center and the LOC Surgery Center, which is a three OR and one procedure room uh, ambulatory surgery center dedicated to orthopedic procedures. Uh, we are an orthopedic group here, <clears throat> a surgical office that treats patients with musculoskeletal issues, uh, in addition to pain management. We have 11 orthopedic surgeons with a variety of subspecialties, and one physiatrist that specializes in pain management, <clears throat> and 10 physician assistants. As you can see behind me, um, if you are looking at the video, um, our physicians are located behind me uh, as my support system today. <laughs> I'm proud that our surgeons uh, help lead the community on postponing elective surgery cases during the initial time of the crisis. 
uh, in a joint press release with another large orthopedic clinic in the community, we announced that we would be suspending elective surgeries in the hospitals uh, and our surgery center. This announcement came three days before the local hospital's decision to take action uh, about this uh, elect uh, action on elective procedures. We did receive a number of kudos uh, on that decision, uh, one coming from one of the hospital's chief of staff. Uh, as you can imagine, there's, there's a lot of pressure for the hospitals to remain open for elective cases. And at the time, and while suggested at the national level, it was not a mandated health measure at the time. Uh, having two large orthopedic groups who are competitors make a joint statement like this made the decision to spend, uh, suspend elective cases for all surgical speci specialties at the hospital much easier. Uh, in an effort to keep patients, staff, and medical providers safe, we have instituted the following items. Um, we uh, instituted a, a screening call uh, that's made the afternoon prior to the next day's scheduled appointment uh, into our office. These calls are made uh, to the patients asking the following questions. Uh, fever, if you've had a fever over 100.4 or higher, uh, if you've experienced a cough or flu-like symptoms, and that's been expanded to, you know, the lack of smell or taste as we've learned more about the symptoms that uh, people experience when they have the COVID uh, uh, indications. Uh, have you or anyone in your household traveled in the past 14 days? Uh, and then we ask that they come to alone to the visit if at all possible. And uh, if you absolutely need to have somebody with you that you limit it to one person. We also have instituted requiring uh, wearing a mask or a face covering while in the clinic. And uh, we ask that they bring that along with them. Um, <clears throat> patients and visitors, uh, they're screened at the front door. Um, and you can see by this slide here, uh, we have that happening. Uh, identifying a patient uh, and only one visitor as necessary. We've asked if they need to have somebody present to hear what the discussion is with the surgeon that they use, um, you know, maybe FaceTime to do that. Um, we take the uh, current temperature and record that, put it on a sticker, that way that follows them through the clinic. Um, we ask that they, uh, if they've been experiencing any cough or flu-like symptoms. We also ask the traveling question, and we have expanded that now to uh, hotbed counties in Nebraska uh, that we specifically ask about. Um, requiring patients to wear the mask in the facility. Um, you'll notice on the next slide, I believe, um, we had some things that came about. Uh, we added plexiglass shields at our front desk. Um, actually, we had our front desk manager um, kind of uh, request that and her husband um, in, within 24 hours made us some really nice little, um, uh, what we call kind of the front desk uh, sneeze protectors. Uh, we also uh, had uh, masks of staff and providers with uh, reusable and handmade masks that. Uh, we use in our patient care areas. We've had some mothers of the staff uh, and local churches that have made some of those for us. And they have an insert with extra shielding uh, that we've made from some of our sterile pack uh, material. Um, <clears throat> replacing our lobby chairs with plastic stackable chairs. I believe that's maybe the next slide. Um, it, 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 uh, you can see that we've also uh, created social distancing with lobby chairs and uh, signage throughout the area, reminding of the mission uh, of that social distancing. Uh, we also uh, had a crew of employees that uh, twice a day we wipe down our exam rooms with antiviral solutions that will kill COVID and wiping down waiting rooms and furniture uh, surfaces two times a day. Um, we postponed scheduling elective sur surgeries until uh, this next Monday, which uh, our mandate is off at that point in time. Uh, we pared down the office schedules to urgent and emergent visits up until that time to help keep orth orthopedic needs out of the ERs, the urgent cares, and the primary care physicians' offices so that they can focus on the sick patients. Uh, asking staff to take their temperatures at home before coming into the office 
And if above 99.4, we ask that they stay home. Uh, we designed, if you can see the, uh, we kind of have a multiple entrances with to our offices. And uh, this aerial view shows a, a single sidewalk that comes in. We use that as a single point of entry for all of our staff. And we've uh, uh, recorded their temperatures and started logging those as well. We have about 124 employees, including our providers. And while a fairly sizable organization, uh, we feel we have a culture of family. Um, our physicians care for our staff and their families and every decision that has been made has been done so with the safety of our patients and staff and providers in mind. Uh, the physicians decided early that they would take care of their work family uh, for as long as possible. Uh, we were one of the first in the community to apply and receive funding for under the CARES uh, 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 PPP program in, in order to keep our staff employed uh, during the significant slowdown in our clinic and surgeries. Um, the measure of uh, patient screening, employee screening, and social distancing within the clinic really has made a difference. We all pray that um, our patients, staff, and providers stay safe and healthy. And we really look forward to bringing things back online soon, and we'll do so with safety in mind. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and let me know if you have any questions that I can try to answer. Great, well, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, we hope you'll stay around because uh, you probably have some questions uh, that uh, we'll want to ask uh, of you. Our uh, second presenter this afternoon is Michelle Darnell. She has been the Human Resources and Benefits Manager for CJ Foods for the past six years. She manages the HR function for the Ingredient Division and Benefit Plans for the Corporation. Prior to CJ Foods, Michelle worked in the retail industry for 20 years as a store manager for companies like Macy's, Target, Kohl's, and Toys R Us. Uh, Michelle, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Um, happy to have the opportunity to um, to work with the panel today. Um, as um, as Chris said earlier, um, CJ Foods we're a co-packing facility um, for we're a premium pet food manufacturer. Um, so you may not necessarily see anything in the marketplace with the CJ Foods name on it, um, as as we package and produce products for other pet food companies. Um, we support eight production facilities in six states. Um, so we, we have facilities in Kansas, Nebraska, Texas, Washington State, Utah, and Pennsylvania, um, which employs approximately 850 employees um, throughout the country. Um, so some of the critical, um, critical things that we have come up against as part of, of the COVID pandemic, um, hiring and staffing. Um, our business is a little bit different in the fact that we've been deemed a critical infrastructure employer. Um, and we're continuing to run at a full schedule. Um, our business has actually picked up, um, and as a result, we're working to hire um, and to fill open positions that we have in our facilities. Um, and as a result, recruitment has been difficult um, with the new unemployment payments that are available um, as part of the CARES Act. Um, sometimes individuals are finding it more lucrative to be um, stay at home instead of working. Um, and at times it can be challenging um, to follow those social distancing guidelines um, in some production areas, um, as well as during um, new hire orientation. As far as communication goes, at times that's been challenging as well, keeping team members updated on policy changes as they take place. Um, as you're all very well aware, this is a very fluid situation um, and changing day by day, um, as well as making sure that there's communication between human resources and our team members. Um, about COVID, um, what they're facing, have, are, are they experiencing signs and symptoms? Do they have a family member? Um, have they been exposed? Um, and keeping those lines of communication open. Um, as well as keeping up with state regulations. Um, we operate in six states um, and each state is a little bit different in the way that they're responding to the virus, um, as well as the impact that the virus is having. Um, you know, here in Northeast Kansas, Southeast Nebraska, um, we've maybe, we've definitely had a little bit less of an impact um, than our facility in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, they're unfortunately located in one of the hotbeds um, of where the virus is, is really amping up. So, you know, working, working with, with each state government as well. 
Um, so with that, um, some of the things that we have done as an employer, um, we established a virus response team or a VRT task force. Um, this team is comprised of not only human resources, but leaders throughout the organization. Um, our CEO, our human resources director, our quality director, um, operations team members, and we meet three times a week um, to provide updates. Um, maybe things we haven't thought about, how are things going in each of the facilities, um, and just to continue to, to manage, um, manage the process um, and make sure that we're prepared and ready um, in the event something were to happen in one of our facilities. Um, we've provided additional training, um, not only for our managers, but also for our employees about what COVID is, um, how it, how it um, spreads, what they can do to keep themselves safe, but also providing additional training for our management team on HIPAA and ADA guidelines as well um, to make sure that we're staying in compliance with government regulatory um, information as well. We've, we've updated a number of policies. We're encouraging sick employees to stay home. Um, we have temporarily, as part of that, suspended our attendance points policy so that team members that call in sick are no longer um, receive attendance points um, during this time. We've also updated quarantine events and, and leave policies. Um, so if a team member, um, we're following um, the CDC guidance um, as far as quarantine events, and if, say, we have a team member that needs to be quarantined um, because of possible exposure or because they themselves have been diagnosed with, with the virus, um, we're applying any PTO that they have. And if they don't have enough paid time off, then the company is paying their regular rate of pay, including shift differential or mandatory overtime, um, through the remainder of the pay period um, or through the remainder of the shift, um, depending on how long they have to be out. We've also increased cleaning and sanitizing protocols. Um, we have a pretty stringent set of protocols in place because we're, we're a food manufacturing fac facility, but we've increased those protocols um, to make sure that, that um, we're, we're doing everything we can to, to mitigate risk um, for, for our team members. We've also, we also utilize, utilize a lot of temporary staffing um, agencies. So we've, we've reached out to those agencies and are working with them to ensure that they're following our protocols um, for any temporary labor that they may be sending to the facility, um, ensuring that they're doing temperature checks, if they're ride sharing, um, limiting the number of individuals um, that are in the vehicle, those types of things to help promote social distancing um, and to mitigate, mitigate risk. We've also implemented a temporary visitor policy. Um, we have a screening questionnaire um, that we utilize to help determine if a visitor is allowed into our facility. Um, we've also worked to prioritize projects. Um, what needs to be done now? What can wait um, until later um, when, when there's less risk of exposure? This visitor questionnaire, we're sending it out to our vendors ahead of time, um, asking them to, to answer those questions and return it to us. Um, if there is a, a yes answer, then we're asking some additional questions to help determine um, the best course of action and, and if the, the vendor is allowed to come on site. Um, we're also following up with them a couple days prior to their visit just to make sure nothing has changed um, at that point in time. Then this week, um, we also implemented temperature screening protocols. So temperature checks are mandatory for all employees and all visitors um, at our facilities. We're logging that. Um, any individuals um, with a temperature of 100.4 or higher um, are, are being sent home or being asked not to report to work. Um, if we, we find it out when they get to work, they're, they're being sent home and then working with human resources on the next, next steps or plan of action. Other things to keep in mind, um, from a benefits perspective, um, we've made some revisions to our, our medical plan um, because of changes that were announced and passed as part of the CARES Act. Um, you know, making sure that our team members know that COVID-19 testing and treatment is covered at 100% um, under our medical plan, that um, we do offer a high deductible health plan, and that the telehealth benefit no longer has cost sharing for those on that plan, and that, that the flexible spending account plan, um, there's changes that have taken place that allow over-the-counter medications um, and menstrual care product purchases now. So we're in the process of working with our um, legal counsel to update our cafeteria plan documents. Um, along other changes, 401k plan provision changes. 
um, that, that now allow for coronavirus related distributions, loan or hardship withdrawal amounts that have been temporarily increased, um, loan origination fees being waived, um, waivers of the early distribution penalty tax, as well as the 20% normal tax withholding um, on, on withdrawals, as well as the suspension of required minimum distributions. So again, working with your 401k advisor, your 401k plan provider, um, as you've got up to two years to be able to update your 401k documents um, if you want to allow these types of um, changes as well as making sure that you're, you're taking a look at your cafeteria plan document. Um, we've actually relaxed um, the hours requirements for benefit eligibility um, due to changes that may be triggered by COVID-19. So if there, you know, there's an individual um, that, that has to be out um, and, and is not able to work, um, you know, don't want them to lose their benefit eligibility maybe because of this. So we've, we've worked with our, our benefit council um, to update our cafeteria plan document as well. So I'd highly encourage you to, to partner um, with your broker or benefit providers to understand the relaxed eligibility guidelines um, and, and work with them to do what's best for, for you and your team um, as well. So with that, I'll, I'll turn things back over to Chris. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, very informative. We've got a couple questions coming in, uh, and we'll address those at, uh, as Kevin gets done here. But uh, uh, Michelle, with CJ Foods, it's clear that your virus response team that you, you put together with the leaders of the key areas in your facilities have really, uh, really stepped up and done a great job uh, for your organization and, and to keep your employees safe. So our, uh, our third presenter this afternoon, is Kevin Suttle. Kevin is the Chief Operating Officer for the Francis Howell School District in St. Charles, Missouri. He brings over 40 years of school district experience to his position. In 2007, he was named the Missouri School Business Official of the Year. He has responsibility for all financial aspects of the district's $230 million budget while supervising payroll, benefits, and risk management administration for the district's 2,500 employees. Kevin, thanks for joining us today and uh, welcome. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you. Great, thank you so much, Chris. So uh, we serve uh, about 17,000 students. So uh, uh, one of the larger school districts in the state of Missouri. And uh, we're spread out over 150 square miles. So we have some unique challenges associated with transporting uh, students to and from uh, school. So all of that factors into some of the conversation that we've been having about what happens as we uh, return to normal operations. So we got fairly quick notice about the need to close our schools in accordance with social distancing guidelines. Uh, we had our students on spring break and during the week that the students were on spring break we learned that we would not be returning to school. So uh, good news for some of the students, I'm sure that they had a, an extended spring break, but it made for some very quick decision making on our part. We had recently received uh, permission through the State Department of Education to begin thinking about uh, providing virtual learning opportunities as a way to make up for snow days, uh, time that we might miss uh, due to snow closures. So while we were beginning to think about those plans, we really hadn't moved very far along in that, uh, but our closure uh, required us to amp that up very, very quickly. So in a very short period of time, we developed an, uh, a way for us to provide some virtual learning opportunities for our students. We also had to think about what's gonna happen to the rest of our staff. So our teachers were going to be actively engaged in providing alternative education opportunities for our kids. But what about our custodians and our bus drivers? We know that they didn't have the same opportunity to uh, perform roles at home the way that someone like me uh, can work remotely. So we had to find some meaningful ways to keep them engaged in, in their work. We provided virtual learning opportunities for both our custodians and our bus drivers. Uh, in order to keep them engaged because we made a commitment to our employees to continue to uh, pay their salaries uh, during the period of closure. 
In order to facilitate some of that work, we provide our uh, provided our students with uh, Chromebooks and hotspots. For those that we weren't able to provide those, we did provide some paper packets, at least initially, in order to ensure that everybody could get started right away. We also had to expand our virtual private network so that file sharing was available for people like in my department that we could access the critical information uh, necessary to process uh, payroll and uh, accounts payable and so forth. Some things that I have done specifically just within my department in order to maintain a working relationship, uh, I've held weekly Zoom meetings with my department, which have been very well received. Uh, people appreciated the opportunity just to see each other's faces and to have an opportunity to uh, share some social interaction, even if it's over a computer screen. I've also sent daily emails to my department staff members. Uh, these are sort of a couple of purposes. We do uh, have some tips about working from home, uh, provide some information about ways to cope with stress that might uh, uh, come as a result of the social isolation. I have made it a uh, work requirement uh, that people engage in some physical activity. They can choose how to do that, but I've told them that my direction to them is you have to carve out some time of your regular eight hour day and do something that uh, you know, gets you outside or otherwise gets you active. And we've also included some uh, a daily joke. Uh, which has generated a lot of positive response. So uh, I've invited people to share some, um, uh, make some contributions in that area, and they've really enjoyed doing that. We also had to think about what are the things that typically happen that we need to find a way to uh, deal with a little bit differently. We have a number of students within our community who are, uh, meet the requirements for free and reduced lunch programs. And for some of those students, uh, the meals that they receive at school are the only uh, su substantive food that they get during the week. So we didn't want to abandon that just because our schools were closed. We've been able to open up some food distribution sites at our various uh, schools in order to provide an opportunity for uh, meals for students and for their families. So through a combination of financial donations and food drives that we have had, we've been able to provide some pretty substantial support in terms of food for our families who are most in need. And another opportunity that presented itself is some families are not able to get out to the distribution sites. So we've been able to utilize our bus drivers who are already familiar with the neighborhoods to use our school buses to bring the meals to our families. As we think about returning to school in the fall, uh, and there are still a lot of unknowns around that uh, topic, these are some of the things that we are dealing with. What are we gonna to do to keep our buildings clean, not only in preparation for students coming back, but on a daily basis once they're back in, in place? Uh, there's been some conversation about the need to have smaller class sizes in order to maintain social distancing. Earlier on in the presentation, you saw the hierarchy of controls and the very first level was to eliminate those working conditions that might uh, pose some problems. Uh, that might be easier to do in an environment that deals primarily with adults, uh, but it's gonna be pretty difficult for us to maintain social distancing uh, in a typical class of about 20 uh, kindergarten students. Uh, they just aren't wired for that. So how can we do some things to uh, help them out? But one thing might be to stagger the schedules where only half the kids come in the morning and the other half come in the afternoon which may uh, require us to think differently about how we uh, develop our school calendars. Uh, we may only have uh, certain uh, students in school on certain days. Attendance policies, much like uh, staff attendance policies, will have to think differently about student attendance policies. It's still undecided what's gonna happen with those large assemblies, uh, you know, sporting events, even uh, team practices. Uh, we haven't gotten clear guidance yet from our county health department about what may or may not be permitted as we move forward. So we're being very tentative, but beginning to make plans in those regards. There is no question that remote learning will continue to be a part of what it is we provide for uh, our community. 
even if we don't stagger our classes, we imagine that there's going to be a need for us to do uh, some remote learning for those students who either because of their own health circumstances or their parents' circumstances may not be able to attend on a regular basis. And finally, and, and very important for us, is we need to think about the social and emotional impacts that COVID has on our kids. We had already noticed that there was a significant increase in the number of students who needed to have some support around social and emotional needs well before uh, COVID came along. So now that kids have been home for a while and experiencing uh, a new reality that's probably very frightening for them, once they return to uh, school, what other supports might we uh, need to be able to provide to help make sure that they're successful and, and are able to uh, participate fully in the educational program. So these are some things that, again, we're not uh, completely finished with, uh, but school is going to look very different uh, when we return uh, in the fall uh, than it ever has, and probably some changes uh, related to things that were done as a result of COVID will become part of our normal instructional practices. Thanks, Chris. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. And, and I, I can speak for all the parents that have been homeschooling their kids for a while that uh, uh, we look forward to them going back to school and uh, uh, teachers all need a raise. Uh, and I'm, I'm married to a teacher and she's struggling teaching from home. So, uh, Excellent um, case, case uh, presentations. Uh, there are a couple questions. Uh, the first one, uh, Doug, if I can address this to you. Uh, specifically, this came, came through the chat box to you. Uh, you mentioned about take, um, taking the temperature before coming to work, and if it's 99.4, they're asked to stay home. Um, they take the temperature again when arriving to work. What is the temperature when you send staff home and when are they able to return back to work? Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, yes, we do ask them to take it at home to prevent them from coming in if it is elevated at home. We use 99.4, which is a degree less than the, the 100.4 that we use for our patients. Uh, but we do so knowing that there's a lot of different variances in, uh, in the various uh, temperature probes. And uh, so we, we went with a lower number. And then when they arrive here, if they are 99.4 or higher, uh, then we evaluate, you know, maybe some reasons why, and then we send them home and we ask that they, uh, they see a, uh, a physician for that um, and, and get a response from them. And we would require a, a, a note from the physician. Great. Okay, uh, this next question is actually uh, for all three of you, so I'll let you, you know, all address it. Um, but they, uh, the comment was, very well done. Have there been any cases at any of your locations? Um, sounds like their efforts have been very effective. So um, go ahead and uh, chime in. Uh, I'll start out. Um... Uh, an individual that, and I'll, I'll try to be sensitive about privacy, but uh, an individual that I work very closely with um, uh, has been diagnosed and is uh, currently at home self-isolating. Uh, she's not yet uh, required hospitalization, uh, but she did have an opportunity to interact with a number of people at one of our high schools. And so we've been very careful about following the uh, County Health Department's guidelines uh, about isolation once uh, we know there's been a known exposure. So um, we've been very fortunate, I think, given the size of, of our uh, staff, uh, that there have not been uh, more cases, uh, but it was a very quick learning curve. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, people are all very understanding and are willing to uh, adapt to uh, the restrictions placed on them by the County Health Department in order to keep themselves and their other colleagues safe. I would say for CJ Foods, um, luckily we have not yet had anyone diagnosed um, with the virus um, within any of our production facilities. We've had a number of individuals that have, have been tested um, and, and were quarantined um, during that testing time. Um, but luckily all of those, those test results have come back negative. 
um, and those individuals have been able to return to work um, based on guidance from the CDC as well as our local health departments. Um, we, we've been very cautious um, in, in following the quarantine guidelines um, in individuals that have been gone on PTO um, and traveled to, to high focal areas. We implemented a mandatory 14-day quarantine um, before they could even return to work. So um, trying to do everything we can to help mitigate exposure. Um, if those individuals could work from home, then they, they worked at home during those quarantine times. Um, otherwise, individuals, um, we paid them um, for their time. And for us here at Lincoln Orthopedic Center and the LOC Surgery Center, uh, we have not had a confirmed case early on. Uh, we had one uh, staff member that experienced some uh, symptoms that are similar, uh, was uh, tested, uh, and she had uh, tested for influenza A, and uh, she quarantined and uh, was able to come back to work with a physician's note. Uh, we did have a couple of providers that uh, had traveled early on in this and they were quarantined for 14 days just based off of their travel. But uh, again, we've been fortunate enough not to have any cases here. Great. Well, that, uh, that speaks to how well prepared and uh, that you all were. I've got uh, just two more questions now before we're up on the four o'clock and uh, one is for Kevin and then uh, the, the next one will be for uh, one of our panelists who we have not heard from but was in on involved in this project from the beginning, uh, Elizabeth Ab Abdallah. Uh, Kevin, uh, question is, the staggering the schedules is a great idea. Is there any thought to how this is going to affect uh, parents who work full time who may not be able to get off work to get their kids to to the afternoon school or to the morning school. Um, and that actually speaks well to if we stagger our employee times, how that might affect uh, folks. Have you given any thought to that? Chris, we've had a significant amount of conversation about childcare. Um, we uh, typically during the school year already offer a before and after school care program. So uh, it probably will need to look a little bit different. Uh, uh, we're beginning to stretch we know that our child care program is going to have to be structured a little differently. Um, we're talking now about having kids work in uh, a, a class of six or seven, and that class, if you would, would just stay together all the time. They would eat lunch in the classroom and, and so forth. I'm talking about before and after school care. Uh, so we may need to expand our, our program. It, currently operates from 6 a.m. until the start of school and from the end of school until 6 p.m. in order to cover those working hours. Uh, but we may need to uh, think more about a, a year-round summer schedule where those uh, before and after school care opportunities are available for parents all day long so that if my kid comes in the afternoon, I can drop them off early in the morning and they're covered until class begins and then they would come home on the bus in the afternoon or reverse that schedule. Uh, but yes, we're very sensitive to the need for childcare, not just for uh, parents, but also for our staff members uh, who need to be able to um, not worry about their own children uh, because they have 30 other kids that they're responsible for during the day. So uh, very heavy on our minds and we've got some plans. Uh, hopefully uh, it'll all work out. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, the, we had a question about uh, how how do we help our employees cope with the psychological impact of the constant uncertainty? Uh, do you have any ideas uh, that you'd like to share with us? Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, so this is, of course, the only time my dog is going to bark. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so uh, that's a really good point. We are. Um, we, we know the importance of, of being transparent, uh, letting people know how unbelievably important it is to share what are, the, uh, what are the knowns, what are the unknowns, what is it that we need to ensure uh, that we're, uh, we are needing to share with our employees. So for instance, uh, whether it's the business hours, if, if uh, it's employment, uh, that that something is going to shift if there are changes if they're anticipating changes 
that's really extraordinarily important to share with employees. So there is great transparency. Uh, something that KU has been doing at our University of Kansas, at the medical school, we've been offering uh, communications from uh, our uh, deans. They have been communicating on a weekly basis about the status of what we know and what we don't know. And that I think is a, a really great resource. I will finally end with the fact that um, the resources that are going to be available here through the guide, I think will be very helpful in uh, lining out what are some uh, opportunities that the employer can take to ensure that we're able to uh, provide the best health and safety measures for our employees. So thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to our panelists. Um, outstanding job. There are other examples of companies and uh, programs and policies that they've implemented in their workplaces in the employer guide. I'm gonna end here. Um, we're at four o'clock, a little bit over, and um, I do wanna thank our partners, uh, the St. Louis Business Health Coalition, the Nebraska Safety Council, and um, University of Kansas Medical School. We really appreciate their support and help with putting this together. As I mentioned, you'll be receiving an email after this webinar, which will have the link to the guide, and also a short survey to get feedback on the guide. So please reach out if you have questions, and thank you very much for your time.